Just after 6 a.m. on March 31, 2020, joggers running through the University of Wisconsin-Madison were stopped in their tracks. The joggers saw what they thought were an older man and woman covered in blood just off the shoulder of the roadway at the university's arboretum. When one of the joggers said she would get help, the woman victim raised her hand slightly. She was still alive. Madison and university police officers and paramedics arrived at the scene at 6.41 a.m. The man, who was only in his underwear, was clearly dead. The woman, who was wearing pajamas and socks but no shoes, was showing signs of life despite a severe head wound. It was only 30 degrees Fahrenheit, or minus 1 degrees Celsius outside. The woman was immediately rushed to the university hospital. An hour later, at 7.54 a.m., she was pronounced dead. The cause of death was gunshots from a 357 SIG handgun. Police were now investigating a double homicide. But these weren't just any two unfortunate victims. These were highly regarded and well-respected people at the university and in the community. It wouldn't take investigators long to narrow down the suspect list. That wasn't really the problem. The problem was getting over the baffling motive. The following is the story of Beth Potter and Robin Kari. Madison, the capital city of Wisconsin, the second largest city by population after Milwaukee. It is named after one of America's founding fathers, James Madison. It has a well-known state capital, which includes a dome modeled after the US Capitol in Washington. It's also known as the Center for Progressive Political Activity, Protests, and Demonstrations, and is overall considered a political liberal city. It is here where our story takes us. 52-year-old Beth Potter was born on November 28, 1967 in Springfield, Illinois to Mary Jo and James Potter. She graduated from Knox College with a degree in French before attending Rush University Medical College in Chicago. She completed her family medicine residency at the University of Wisconsin-Madison and became a faculty member in the university's Family Medicine and Community Health Department. Her primary practice site was the Axis Community Health Center's Wingra Family Medical Center, where she looked after patients and taught family medicine residents and medical students. She was also the medical director of employee health and well-being services since 2016. Her focus in the field was on wellness, women's health, and underserved communities. According to public posts, Beth was an activist of sorts. She engaged in a number of initiatives for the preservation of forests, raising money for dog sanctuaries, and welcoming refugees. She was a cross-country skier and loved nature. 57-year-old Robin Kari was born on October 17, 1962 in Baltimore, Maryland to Barbara and Paul Kari. He also graduated from Knox College, but with a degree in history before doing his master's degree and doctorate in European history at the University of Illinois, Chicago. He was an adjunct professor at Viterbo University and was the founding member of the Regent Soccer Club in Madison and served as director. Robin founded Kari College Coaching, a self-explanatory business really, which helps students with quote, college search, admissions process, financial aid, and staying sane through. For those who couldn't afford the services, he gave them for free. Besides that, he was a stay-at-home dad who took care of his family, was involved in his community, and who loved sports, music, and travel. He was quiet and soft-spoken, and was known for his intellect, generosity, and wit. Quote, Beth and Robin were kind, loving, gentle people with a passion for family, their chosen work, and community, read an obituary post. At around 9.30 p.m. on the night of March 30, 2020, Beth and Robin were preparing to turn into bed. At the same time, a white Volkswagen Rutan was traveling westbound in the area of East Gorham Street. The van turned into University Avenue and then south in the area of Highland Avenue near Madison West High School at 30 Ash Street and then in the area of Rowley Avenue. At 2212 Rowley Avenue was the Potter Carree residence. 
At 10.30 p.m., the world of Beth and Robin would be turned upside down. A man came into the home and at gunpoint forced Beth and Robin outside into the cold Wisconsin night. The man did not offer them the dignity to put on proper clothes. Robin was in nothing but his underwear and Beth in her pajamas and socks, but neither had shoes on. He forced them into the van, where there was another man waiting. At 10.53 p.m., the occupants in the van were off. They drove for about 26 minutes, a hellishly long time for the victims to contemplate the unknown. Just after 11 p.m., the van stopped near the entrance of the Arboretum, a large greenery area the University of Wisconsin-Madison used to study ecological restoration. There, the man who forced Beth and Robin out of their home now forced them out of the van and into the Arboretum. They were marshaled into the greenery just off the road, their heads bowed, undeniably trembling and asking why he was doing this. The man wasn't going to entertain any questions. He told them to stop and get on their knees. He raised a 357 sig handgun and shot Robin in the left side of his head near his ear, which killed him instantly. Beth didn't have time to process what had happened before she was shot in the upper arm and the back of the head. The man then ran back to the van and the two drove off. On the day the bodies were found, City of Madison police detectives brought 18-year-old Miriam Potter Kari in at the University of Wisconsin Police Department station for questioning. Miriam, nicknamed Mimi, was adopted by Beth and Robin out of an orphanage in Guatemala. What we know about her is that she attended Madison West High School and has at least two sisters from a survey of social media posts. One named Mercedes and another named Maida. With any adopted child, it's very difficult to get much else in terms of information. In photos on Beth's Facebook, she was in the Potter Curry family from a very young age. Miriam said that on the night of March 30 through to the morning of March 31, both her and her boyfriend, 18-year-old Kari Sanford, were staying at their Airbnb at Sunny Mead Lane. On the night of March 30, in fact, she said they had been watching the movie Hangover 2, barely making it to the end of the movie before they collapsed and fell asleep. At no point did either of them leave the Airbnb, she told police. Kari Obedia Terrell Sanford was born on May 22, 2001. He went to the same high school as Miriam, where he attended starting in 2015. He is reportedly from Chicago and had a rough upbringing. According to Wisconsin court records, he was charged with vehicle theft in 2019. At the time of the theft, he said his own foster parents left for Africa without taking him and he was upset with them. So he took their car after disabling the home surveillance cameras and was found sleeping in it. Kari was put into a deferred prosecution program in which he was given the opportunity to complete counseling and community service in exchange for the theft charge being dropped. Part of the difficulty with reporting this story now is that much of the information posted by the subjects has since been deleted. The only surviving information comes from secondary sources that initially relied on the primary sources that have now been taken down. For example, most of Kari's social media pages have been deleted, which would contain a lot more about him. Surviving information from secondary sources has him as the president of the Black Students' Union and captain of the football team. His Twitter page, however, is still up. In it, he includes several book emojis, alluding to his focus on his studies. He liked and positively responded to tweets from U.S. House Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez about public health and access to COVID tests, and from Barack Obama about economic growth and job creation. Sanford also made comments about the police on Facebook, including complaining about high pedestrian tickets relative to the size of the black population, how cops are snowflakes, and how police need to be policed. He also shot back at people calling him a nerd, responding in essence that he will always be smarter and have more money than them. In response to a friend, he said, quote, We gotta lift the youth by gaining knowledge and speaking it and spreading it. We can't change crap unless we convince the world to change. That's why we gotta be prevalent to the youth so they, we, make a life where everybody share the responsibility of upholding the common good in all societies. In any event, Miriam and Kari came from similar backgrounds. Both had foster parents, 
they were the same age, and they shared the same tastes and interests. They appeared to be the perfect teen couple, but maybe not so much to the parents. WHO has been assessing this outbreak around the clock and we're deeply concerned both by the alarming levels of spread and severity and by the alarming levels of inaction. We have therefore made the assessment that COVID-19 can be characterized as a pandemic. On March 11, 2020, the world comes to a halt. COVID-19 is declared a pandemic and lockdowns become the norm. With increasing reports of this novel illness causing death at a rapid rate, everyone is now social distancing, the modern version of which was developed during the George W. Bush presidency. This practice was taken very seriously in the Potter Kari residence. Beth was assisting with the virus outbreak at the university hospital. She was an eyewitness to the virus's devastation on the human body. Fever, coughing, body aches, restricted breathing, nausea, vomiting, loss of taste or smell, and of course, death. Still more frightening was the ease with which the virus spread and the virus's reproductive factor, also called the r naught, which determines the number of people on average that one infected person will then infect afterward. Beth was working the trenches despite taking medication that put her at greater risk of contracting the virus's infection. So she required everyone to be on board with social distancing rules everywhere, including at home. Robin understood this very well. The loving couple was a power unit that respected each other's needs. And so Robin took it upon himself to self-quarantine whenever he would feel any inkling of illness. Meanwhile, Beth, who didn't want to self-quarantine, felt compelled to provide Kari a home after his own dysfunctional foster parent situation. After all, their own daughter came from a difficult childhood, raising her on the altruistic belief that all children deserve the chance. And so, since the start of the pandemic, Kari stayed at the Potter Kari residence. But kids will be kids. They were a bit of a handful at times, as teens are. This included Kari and Miriam leaving the house frequently, breaking the COVID rules of the home. Instead of forcing Miriam and Kari out on the street, Beth and Robin decided it was best that they rent the kids an Airbnb starting around the middle of March until she can arrange a permanent housing solution. And so, the teen couple began preparations for the move into the Airbnb on 213 Sunny Mead Lane. As far as we know, according to testimony, they were moved into the temporary residence by at least March 17. Miriam told the detective that her parents let the teen couple use their car, a white 2012 Volkswagen Rutan, for the move. According to an initial report, detectives confirmed several times Miriam's statement that neither her nor Kari had left the Airbnb residence on the evening of March 30 after 10.15 p.m and that the van had been with them the whole time. Miriam even consented to a search of her phone. On April 2, a trained digital forensic analyst conducted a search of the phone and recovered some almost cryptic call and messaging data from the evening of March 30 and into the early morning hours of March 31. One specific data point stuck out like a sore thumb. 9.48 p.m. Missed call. From Miriam to contact Kari Sanford. During his investigation, Special Agent Kenneth Folkers of the Wisconsin Department of Justice came across the name Elijah LaRue, nicknamed Huncho, after a conversation with a Madison West High School student, anonymously referred to by his initials DF. Elijah LaRue was born on March 15, 2002, to Alice LaRue in a religious family. The 18-year-old was from Chicago and worked as a cashier at Hollister, according to his Facebook page, although that should be taken with a grain of salt, as there are some other discrepancies in his social media page that doesn't really add up. He had at least two siblings. He was set to graduate from Madison West High School in 2020 when investigators descended on his home and asked him some questions about the night of March 30. 
As far as we know, not much came out of Elijah during the interview, but he did consent to a forensic search of his phone. The following is a map tracing his phone location during that night. On April 3, 2020, a person anonymously referred to by their initials ER opened the door to the UW-Madison Police Department and asked to speak to someone about the Potter Curry murders. ER was clutching a package. When a police rep approached, ER identified themselves as an employee of the Blessed Sacrament Parish School and Church located at 2121 Rowley Avenue. Crucially, the church and its school had exterior surveillance cameras that essentially provided a bird's eye view about one block east of the Potter Curry residence. ER was clutching the surveillance tape from the night of March 30. He handed it over. The police observed a white van traveling eastbound at 9.43 p.m., then westbound at 9.53 p.m., then eastbound turning northbound on South Allen Street at 9.59 p.m., and then eastbound at 10.05 p.m. Then at 10.53 p.m., headlights of a vehicle turning north at the intersection from traveling eastbound on Rowley Avenue. Crucially, it was the only vehicle driving at this time on this quiet street. Critically, the movement synced perfectly with Elijah's phone data. At around 5.30 p.m. on Monday, March 30, just hours before her murder, Beth called a good friend of hers for their evening walk together. The two met up and exchanged pleasantries. They updated each other with how their days had been going. The conversation entered COVID talk, as the pandemic easily found its way in every conversation on Earth at this time. Beth would tell her friend, identified only as LG, about how crazy the hospital atmosphere is, how the virus was the real deal, and how she was trying to cope with her increased sensitivity to getting infected. Beth told LG that she had moved Miriam and Kari into an Airbnb temporarily until she and Robin could find them a more permanent accommodation. But LG knew something wasn't right. Beth, she noted, wasn't herself. When speaking about Miriam and Kari, she would get frustrated, which was atypical of Beth. And then she kind of just let a little bit out. They are not respectful to me, Beth said, referring to Miriam and Kari. We house them, we, we feed them, and, and the respect is, is just not reciprocated. They leave the house and enter whenever they want. They don't follow our COVID house rules. They do what they wish with no sense as to the dangers of this virus. It was conveyed that ever since Miriam met Kari in the spring of 2019, Miriam had been in a tailspin. Her grades, her mental health, her relationship with her parents were deteriorating. This is more than LG was expecting from the reserved Beth. Beth was a consummate professional who would normally bottle up any frustrations and not let her emotions cloud her judgment. That's why they moved the kids to temporary housing, Beth continued, but Miriam and Kari didn't really take it all that well. As Miriam was dragging her belongings outside of the Potter Curry residence, she remarked, quote, you don't care about me. She also told her own mother that, quote, you don't talk to me. But Beth told another version of the household environment. Miriam and Kari would just literally sit in her bedroom all the time and order food and they just didn't communicate with me, she would say. Beth did note that Kari was more quiet about the move, but it was really Kari that she was more concerned about. LG said Beth had bad feelings about him. LG would remark that she knew more bad stuff was going on, but Beth didn't tell her. Beth's supervisor at the University of Wisconsin Hospital and Clinics, only identified by the initials NK, corroborated LG's information, saying she felt the teens were not respectful. 
Not only was Beth handling the burden of COVID and the increased hospital patient traffic, but she was also dealing with the stress of two rebellious teens at home. Quote, Beth was usually very calm, but lately she's been acting stressed and not like herself, NK would say. I swear I'm telling you, man, I hit them. I hit them. How did they survive? Kari said, raising his voice just above a whisper into his cell phone as he paced around the room, sweating. He was described as excited but frantic. It was just after 6.30 a.m. on Tuesday, March 31, 2020. Kari had heard on social media that Beth had been rushed to hospital in life-threatening condition, but Kari was more concerned about the fact that she wasn't declared dead in the grass he left her and Robin in after shooting them in cold blood. Kari, face dripping with sweat, had just arrived at the home of a friend, only identified by police as DF. Kari had called DF so he could hide out for a bit. DF sat in the living room as Kari dialed the number for Elijah, who accompanied Kari on their little escapade the night before. It was from this call that DF told detectives about Elijah, which led to his interrogation. Hey man, you hear the news? Kari told Elijah. She's still alive. If she lives, she's going to tell them it was me. I'm scared, man. I swear to God, I shot both of them in the back of the head. The admission would prove fatal. Not because Kari flatly said he killed his girlfriend's parents, but because he said he shot them. Information police and investigators never actually released. In other words, only the killer would know the way they were killed. Kari got off the phone and walked up to DF. Yo, you gotta help me. DF asked for what? I need to hide this gun. DF, taken aback, told Kari to slow down. Bro, I ain't getting involved in none of this. At some point during the night of the murders, a neighbor on Sunny Mead Lane observed the van entering the neighborhood and parking behind the Airbnb. The individuals, identified as Kari and Elijah, were then seen throwing items into the woods south of the property. When investigators searched the woods, they found a crumpled piece of mail addressed to Beth Potter at her residence and a cell phone that appeared to have been deliberately broken. Investigators, with the assistance of prosecutors, had seen enough. The month after the murders, Kari was arrested on two counts of first-degree murder. Elijah was also arrested that month. Bail was set at $1 million for each of Kari and Elijah. First and foremost, I want to offer our deepest sympathies to the family, friends, and colleagues of Dr. Beth Potter and Robin Kari. Beth and Robin were remarkable individuals who positively impacted the lives of so many. Our hearts are heavy and our thoughts are with all who grieve their loss. Today, I am able to announce that through exceptional police work and with the help of many in our community who provided numerous tips, late last night, UWPD officers arrested 18-year-old Kari Sanford. Sanford has been booked into the Dane County Jail on two counts of party to a crime for first degree intentional homicide. Back in November 2019, Kari sent this photo to Miriam. It is of Kari holding his 357 SIG handgun directly into the camera with his finger on the trigger. Special Agent Kenneth Folker spoke to DF on April 4. The teen said he overheard a conversation in which Miriam was telling Kari about how they could obtain money. The trio had been in ceramics class at their high school before the pandemic shut it down when the conversation happened. According to DF, Miriam remarked that her parents had bands of money, meaning thousands of dollars, and that they were rich. As investigators were going through Miriam's phone, they found the photo. But it wasn't sent from Kari to Miriam, but from Miriam to Kari on March 8, possibly suggesting something sinister. Miriam was extremely loyal to Kari, to the point she would do things behind her parents' back to please him while she lived at her parents' place. For example, instead of letting Kari sleep in the car because of his unstable living situation, she would sneak him into her room for many nights. This was clearly against her parents' wishes. Miriam finally asked her parents to let Kari stay at their home in December. Her parents offered to let him stay at their home because they recognized the toll Kari's situation had on her mental health, but only if the two followed the rules of the home. 
Those rules, as we know, were regularly broken. As the bonds between Miriam and Kari grew, so blossomed their shared perspective on their living situation and their rebellious attitude. Miriam, in fact, would text Kari telling him that she didn't like how her parents treated him. And Kari agreed, saying they treated him like a, quote, slave. As the relationship in the Potter Kari household continued to deteriorate, they all decided to have two family therapy sessions. It was shortly after these sessions that Beth arranged to have the Airbnb set up, suggesting nothing beneficial came out of them. On the night of the murders, when Miriam told investigators that Kari and her parents' van remained at their Airbnb, Miriam was sending messages to a friend about the whereabouts of Kari. The following is what investigators pulled out of her phone. 9.50 p.m. Sent a text to contact SD. He didn't pick up. 11.02 p.m. Sent a text to Kari Sanford. At least bring back the car and have someone get you from here. I don't feel safe here. 11.13 p.m. Sent a text to Kari Sanford. Why would you put me in this position? 11.19 p.m. Sent a text to SD. I hear him. I think, though. 11.19 p.m. Sent a text to SD. Like, I think he just pulled up. 11.19 p.m. Sent a text to SD. Like, with someone. 11.19 p.m. Sent a text to SD. But yes, it's him. 11.22 p.m. Sent a text to SD. It's Honcho. 11.22 p.m. Sent a text to SD. His friends got in a situation. 11.26 p.m. Sent a text to SD. I want to cry right now, but I'm also in an apartment with them and it's literally two and a half rooms, so that is fun. Prosecutors settled on the motive that it was, ultimately, social distancing rules in the house that sealed the victim's fate. The court heard about Kari's upbringing and his difficult living situation. They also heard from Miriam, who detailed the fractious relationship between the teen couple and her parents. She was given immunity in exchange for her testimony. Kari was found guilty on May 2022 on both counts of first-degree murder after a week-long jury trial. So that was me, the adult, the advocate, the activist, and the suicidal varsity football player after school, wondering where I was going to sleep. Because my decision to finally stand up for my mother and my siblings got me kicked out, forced to sleep in dealership cars or not sleep at all, and rely on what I found stole or sold to buy a pot to piss in until a young woman named Mel approached me one day and proposed to me her idea for a relationship with me and without warning her about all of my mental and emotional instabilities I accepted her proposal. She showed me a world that I at the time didn't believe existed. A world filled with unconditional love and unconditional care. And then she introduced me to two beautiful people who saw my potential accepted my adversities and took me in so that was me in the home of beth and robbins with mental health issues not communicating very well smoking weed disobeying rules and procrastinating way too much about my future because i was too fanatically in love to care in September 2022, he was sentenced to life without parole. Kari getting a life sentence after a guilty verdict was never in dispute. It was whether he should be eligible for parole after 25 years. The judge said that if, after all Beth and Robin did for him meant their death sentence, there is no way anyone in society could trust that he wouldn't kill them for any reason. 
Elijah took a plea deal on two counts of felony murder as a party to a crime. He testified against Kari. He was sentenced to eight years, with ten years of extended supervision. The story would appear straightforward, but some corners of the internet are still wondering about motive. Floating is speculation that racial tensions may have contributed. Observers speculate that Kari's public position on racial injustices against black people coupled with his slave comment about his living situation may have played a role. Another cohort thinks money was involved. That includes the victim's estate lawyer. Quote, Miriam was complicit and participated in a plan to rob her parents, which led to the senseless killings and tragic murders, alleged the estate lawyer last year. The lawyer filed to exclude Miriam, who was listed in the victim's will, from receiving those benefits. Meanwhile, the University of Wisconsin's Department of Family Medicine and Community Health announced on July 24, 2020, that a memorial fund would be created to establish a scholarship in Robin and Beth's memory. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to me narrate this story. As always, special shout out to the reporters who do the legwork to get the stories to the public first, and to you guys for engaging in the subject matter. I'm always interested in hearing your perspectives, as there are smart people in the chat who may pick up on patterns and inferences and may have theories as to the psychological and sociological aspects of these crimes. In any event, if you liked what you saw, consider the serving of buttons below the screen. In the meantime, please be safe, and of course, please don't be Elijah LaRue or Kari Sanford.